morning, uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, uh, depending on where you are. Welcome to the webinar discussion on shrinking policy space in the international trade regime, hosted here at Boston University's Global Development Policy Center. The BU Global Development Policy Center is a university-wide research center that works to advance policy-oriented research for financial stability, human well-being, and environmental sustainability across the globe. My name is Rachel Thrasher, researcher at the GDP Center, legal scholar and author of his new book, Constraining Development, The Shrinking of Policy Space in the International Trade Regime. Uh, if you check the chat shortly, there should be a discount code uh, for 20% off the purchase price, uh, incidentally. Um, consisting of one multilateral trade agreement, more than 300 preferential free trade agreements, and almost 3,000 bilateral investment treaties, the global trading system seeks to establish a stable regulatory environment. Yet, the COVID-19 pandemic and worsening climate crisis have laid bare an unresolved tension between this network of rules and the needs of the system's individual countries. Recent troubling trends in treaty making and international jurisprudence suggest that global rules have increasingly constrained the policy space of national governments to pursue development and economic expansion aims. My new book highlights how this encroachment takes place, especially in the areas of industrial and investment policy, in capital flow management and debt policy, as well as health and climate policy. The shrinking of policy space is compounded by a growing number of international legal cases at the World Trade Organization and in investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, which have demonstrated the teeth and power of these treaties. I am honored to be joined today by Hajun Cheng, one of my favorite economist authors and a major contributor to the foundational ideas in my book. Um, Hajun has been teaching economics at the University of Cambridge Faculty of Economics and Development Studies uh, since 1990. He is an associate editor of the Cambridge Journal of Economics and has worked as a consultant for numerous international organizations, including various UN agencies, the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank. He has also consulted for a number of national governments and um, in their policymaking decisions. Uh, Hajun has written prolifically over the years, authoring 16 books and 11 edited volumes, the most popular of which is probably kicking away the latter development strategy in historical perspective, which has won several awards. He has also published in numerous high impact journals on issues of trade and industrial policy, theories of the state and the market and globalization. His writing, in addition to being rigorous and insightful, is a delight to read, and I strongly encourage you to find any of his works and begin reading right now or whenever we're done here. Um, so our conversation today is especially poignant um, as the majority of the world's countries prepare for the 12th WTO Ministerial Conference, which we'll call MC12, which is called MC12 in Geneva, um, which is taking place at the end of this month. And against the ba that backdrop, also the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and worsening impacts of climate change, the meeting is highly anticipated. Some countries are seeking to expand the reach of the global rules, introducing new disciplines in investment facilitation and domestic regulation and services, fisheries subsidies and more, while others are looking to the WTO to provide a way forward for greater access to COVID-19 vaccines and other essential products, as well as creating space for a development friendly way forward um, um, in, the, in light of climate change. So while this tension between the different countries trade aims is certainly present today, it's also nothing new. Um, as far back as the mid 20th century, developing countries were increasingly attempting to negotiate for more development friendly trade rules, um, albeit with minimum success. And treaty texts since the mid 1990s have encroached more and more in areas of domestic policy making. So as my book highlights, this encroachment constrains national governments from pursuing development in key ways, including making and maintaining policies they need to promote economic growth, financial stability, debt sustainability, public health and environmental protection. And in response to that reality, I argue that new trade and investment treaties should take a step back from interference with domestic regulatory sovereignty and instead focus on narrower and shallower economic integration at the global level. So before we start to have our conversation, I want to mention that this webinar is being live streamed 
on YouTube, so a recording should be immediately available to all those here. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box located in your Zoom menu to ask those questions, and please provide your name and affiliation. Uh, we will take questions after our initial conversation, but feel free to enter your questions at any time while we're talking. Um, Hajun, I'd love to begin by asking you a question. Um, you have spent many years studying the relationship between national policymaking and development and economics. Um, what would you say has been your most profound finding or conclusion from your research and how does it shape what you're doing today, what your research is today? Thank you, Rachel. Yet, uh, before I begin the, to answer that question, I would uh, really like to thank you for writing this book. You know, I I think it's that uh, really I mean, uh, a very, very valuable contribution to development policy making. You know, I sometimes joke that uh, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, has become the best friend of lazy government officials in developing countries. Because whenever your minister that tells you to do this, do that, all you have to say is, oh, minister, that's banned by the WTO. You know, the minister is not going to uh, go to the library, go through 800 pages of uh, WTO documents and tell you that, no, actually you can do it. <laughs> so the, actually there's a lot of uh, the, like uh, pessimism about uh, the possibility of uh, doing anything because, you know, a lot of people think with uh, the WTO and uh, the various uh, bilateral and regional uh, free trade agreements, there's uh, really no policy space uh, left anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, uh, very, very important that, that uh, we are told that these are possible, these are debatable, these are that, that impossible, but that the only the experience that, that, that trade the lawyers and the legal scholars uh, like you can uh, tell us that, yeah? because I mean, <laughs> I, I confess, I mean, I had to uh, get a uh, uh, kind of half day of uh, the, the personal the tutoring from a the trade lawyer at the UN before I could even read uh, the WTO the documents, yeah? because there are so many jargons and uh, the, the concepts and so on that are uh, not familiar to the, the, the people who are not trained in those uh, languages. So that uh, your book uh, really translates uh, the, the things that, that uh, people like myself and uh, your colleague uh, Kevin Gallagher do, uh, do, you know, we dig up uh, information on the, the, what kind of policies have been done in the past. We try to figure out the theoretical foundations of uh, this or that policy. But when those uh, the, the things need to be translated into concrete policy action, we really need uh, someone like you, someone, uh, something like that, uh, your book. So I really thank you that uh, on behalf of uh, that, uh, people like myself at uh, the uh, Development Economist for really writing this book. It's a uh, uh, marvelous uh, contribution, so clearly, informatively, and, and uh, in great detail written. So I, I, that I would like to start this uh, by thanking you. Now, as, uh, to, as for your question, I, I don't think I would use a word like profound uh, the, for what I've been doing. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, you know, it would be false modesty that, uh, for me to say that, that uh, you know, it's unimportant. I mean, I think I have uh, made uh, some pretty important contributions, but I wouldn't call them profound because that uh, a lot of uh, things what a lot of things that I have done uh, is to, you know, the, dig up uh, historical evidence about how not just the uh, contemporary the uh, development success stories like uh, the Korea and Taiwan, but that uh, the U.S. in the 19th century, the you know the, the U.K. in the, the 18th century, and so on have uh, developed their economies, mm -hmm. and uh, trying to understand what are the economic principles that. Uh, if you like, perennial throughout the ages across the, the, the ge geographical divide and so on, and what were contingent on particular the, the cases, uh, well, contingent in particular cases, mm 
and uh, thereby uh, trying to you know uh, tell people that look uh, that there are these uh, principles that uh, we need to respect uh, like you know the infant industry consideration you know albert hirschman's uh, the idea of uh, the linkages you know uh, the things like that but also the, trying to tell people that, that these that the principles can be and have been interpreted and turned into concrete policies in very diverse ways you know my my favorite example in this regard is uh, Singapore, you know, the, the, when, when we read about Singapore in the standard economics books or the, in, in the financial press, uh, we are only told that the country has a free trade and uh, welcoming attitude uh, towards uh, foreign investors. We will never be told that 90% of land in Singapore is owned by the government. 85% you know, of uh, housing is uh, supplied by a government owned housing corporation. A staggering 22% of GDP is uh, produced by state-owned enterprises, including the famous Singapore Airlines. And even when it uh, welcomes uh, foreign investors, it does not uh, the, the use this uh, kind of laissez-faire, anything goes uh, kind of approach that uh, is uh, recommended uh, by the, the, world, the, the likes of the World Bank and the WTO. I mean, it uh, the goes out uh, the actively, negotiates with the, 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 these companies. Uh, in which uh, the, the government land ownership is uh, a major uh, lever because uh, it can uh, offer land at uh, subsidized price in the strategic locations. And then that, that, that tries to the, you know, integrate what these companies do into the general industrial policy. So, you know, I mean, it's of course uh, a more extreme example, but if you look at the, any real success stories, you will find that uh, the old countries had uh, used uh, very similar principles, but implemented uh, uh, in uh, very, very uh, different ways. And yeah, in uh, thinking about that, I think uh, once again, uh, getting back to your book, uh, the, I mean, the, the books like yours is uh, the, uh, so important because that uh, if you want to translate this uh, the historical lessons and economic principles into concrete uh, policy program, we actually need to know what is allowed, what is not allowed, where is the gray area, what are the things that the that, 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 that rich countries have been doing, and therefore you can that, that, that hide behind that, that what that they have been doing when that, that as a small developing country, you are trying to do something. So yeah, I, 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 I think uh, uh, the, you know, what I have done, yeah, I mean, that has uh, had the, uh, uh, some impact in changing the terms of the debate uh, in the international negotiation for uh, trade and investment agreements. But I think that, that uh, it, I mean, that your, your book will uh, really make that impact even bigger because now that we have a, really a manual to tell people how you can do it. Yeah? So, <laughs> Yeah, that, that I that, uh, once again that, that uh, would like to thank you for <laughs> writing this book. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, taking it uh, from there, I mean, the, I have been kind of uh, arguing for what I call asymmetric uh, protectionism in the international trade agreement. So that uh, as I mean that the, the poorest, uh, least developed countries are allowed to do more or less uh, whatever they that, uh, need to. And then as uh, that you that develop, uh, that you accept more constraints, uh, that, that not simply in the direction of free trade, but in the direction of uh, building a fairer multilateral uh, international economic order. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in the, I mean, well, when you think about that, uh, you find that uh, the biggest uh, problem with the WTO and other international agreements is that uh, there's hardly any recognition of the asymmetry in the needs and capabilities of uh, these countries. Yeah. I mean, there, there are I mean minor concessions here and there, but uh, how do you think that uh, we could uh, that change that? Because that uh, the existing uh, system is already kind of structured 
in that way. I mean, that uh, basically everyone's supposed to do the same except for the least uh, developed countries and developing countries get that, that tiny concession like, oh, you have uh, five more years uh, to make the transition. Yeah. But basically, you know, everyone from uh, Switzerland uh, to the Swaziland is uh, supposed to uh, uh, play by the same rule. Yeah. And uh, how, how, I mean, as uh, someone who's uh, the, 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 an expert uh, in the, the legal the aspect of this, uh, do you think that, that, that it is possible at all to, to rewrite uh, these uh, international uh, agreements that, that to I mean, to have a uh, fairer system? Yeah, is it possible <laughs> to rewrite them? That's, that's, that's a really big question. Um, I mean, I think that I have to say yes, that's why I write what I do, um, that, that we should be you know, always seeking to make changes um, for the improvement of the system. I think that what you're seeing is absolutely correct. And what, what we've seen in the, the treaties is that they don't permit, as you noted um, with your book, Kicking Away the Ladder, that we don't permit what, what, the de current, what today's developed countries um, used for hundreds of years to develop, we don't permit those many of those policies anymore. Um, and and I think the idea of sort of asymmetrical protection or allowing sort of making space for asymmetrical protection in a progressive way is not, it's it's an idea that has like a nod in those WTO agreements, right? We have this concept of special and differential treatment mm. that the WTO embodies in certain you know, very specific instances, and each of the treaties have their little provisions that that allow for some flexibility um, but the flexibilities are largely in um, largely not non-binding so they're either encouraging the developing mm -hmm. the developed countries to extend special treatment to developing countries or sort of giving flexibilities to the developing countries to protect certain areas depending on the treat depending mm -hmm. on the treaty but <clears throat> But it is very hard to see how um, a, a developing country, a, a lower middle income country, could say, I have this flexibility under the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, mm -hmm. so I'm going to impose this policy. Mm -hmm. um, and for them to be able to then defend that affirmatively at the WTO in the face of a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so that has happened in the past where countries even have asserted flexibility that they thought they had and it's oh. been challenged mm -hmm. um, by by developed countries and I think what we see then is that that this this regime and even more so the free trade agreements um, in place that are extra WTO outside of the WTO sure. they tend to um, seal they tend to sort of keep things at the status or prefer the status quo Right. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not interrupting the way that the economy is structured, you're giving preferences to new business and disrupting the benefits that current firms are expecting to receive under this treaty, you're fine. But as soon as you start to mess with mm -hmm. the ways that there's competition in the global uh, economy, then you're going to start to run up against problems. And so, you know, as far as how do we solve that problem, you know, like, um, there's sort of there's sort of the, the practical, maybe the pragmatic approaches. Um, which are going to be piecemeal and incremental. And then there are sort of big picture ideas. Sure. And, and the big picture idea for me is that we shouldn't, I, I think in general, we're going to need to continue to collaborate on a multilateral global level. Mm. There's just mm. too many big problems that are shared problems, right? We yeah. have climate change, we have pandemic, we That's will strange. have the next pandemic. Um, trade and globalization is a thing. We have, yeah. um, global supply chains that are also not going to go away. Not not every country will be able yep. to or should reshore all mm. of their industries. No, no, no. Um, that would be a, a bit of an economic disaster. <laughs> but so we will have to collaborate. Um, but those, those that collaboration needs to um, be shaped in a way for developing countries to have flexibility. Mm. And to the extent that they can't quite do what it is the developed world wants them to do in terms of liberalizing mm -hmm. a specific sector that they're that they need to have capacity building as the aim so the goal that the, the idea that i have 
or, or the idea that, that I shaped this after in my book was the, um, the trade facilitation agreement, which has its, its pros and cons. And I won't say that it's the perfect um, results, but what we have is, a, is, a, is an agreement shaped on, um, or shaped around capacity building so that the developing countries could make commitments in accordance with their capacity and then identify areas where they would need help mm. to make those, to meet mm -hmm. those commitments and then receive technical yeah. help and financial help. So mm. the idea that we would, instead of using trade enforcement measures to sort of punish countries from doing things, that we would instead try to build that capacity, um, that seems like a good way to do it. Mm. It's, mm. it's, it's not a one, it's not a one. Yeah. Um, no, no, I think uh, that, that kind of uh, shifting perspective is uh, really the, in a way, the, the most important thing uh, the, to uh, do the, if you are going to change anything in a major way. The, you know, the, for example, I've always, I mean, once again, I'm not a lawyer, so the, I don't know that the, what the legal meaning of uh, the, those words uh, really are, but the, you know, this idea of special and differential treatment, yeah? Yeah, differential treatment is fine, but why are we calling this a special treatment? You know, it's a bit like uh, calling, I don't know, uh ramps uh, for wheelchair users and uh, braille writing for blind people special treatment yeah <laughs> it's that uh, the differential treatment for people with different needs and capabilities no yeah so i mean that uh, once you begin to the, the, the shift the perspective there are quite a lot of things uh, that i think even the, the rich countries will have to you know at least that uh, the, 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 the implicitly accept but uh, you know the, because the whole way it is that the structure is you know free trade is that uh, given as an absolute good when it actually means that uh, simply that uh, there are no barriers to trade you know? yeah. i mean it doesn't mean that uh, a good thing or a bad thing yeah, yeah. but then uh, it's uh, given this uh, moral value the, this idea of free trade and then anything that deviates that, uh, from that is called the uh, special treatment so already, you know, the, the rich countries can uh, become uh, very patronizing, you know, that uh, this is uh, the, our kind of, you know, paternalistic, uh, the, the, the largest uh, for you is not your right, you know, and so on. And, and that, 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 you know, this uh, idea of uh, dispute settlement, you know, that once again is that, that very problematic. I mean, you've written about it, but that, uh, you know, I mean, why in this area do we suddenly have uh, corporations suing the government in an international panel made of uh, three lawyers, yeah? mm -hmm. rather than at least uh, first uh, going through the international court, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, when you put it like that, I mean, the system looks crazy, but that, uh, because uh, we are seeing it uh, from the wrong perspective, it seems uh, quite reasonable, you know, that, there's something very good called free trade. Yeah, there are rules that, that to ensure that uh, it uh, that uh, is uh, not uh, kind of disrupted, and then anyone who breaks the rules uh, need to be punished. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, that, that is it uh, possible? Do you think that, that to change the, the if you like a legal perspective in all of this to um, to build a better system? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that that's already changing. And so and in mm, that sense, mm. it's certainly possible. Um, you know, I, I think what's been really interesting in uh, during this pandemic, especially is we'll, we've seen a lot of countries deploy all kinds of policies, mm, um, mm. Um, industrial policies that mm. that would traditionally they would not have done. And, mm. and admittedly, it's 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 a it's a global emergency so so those aren't going to necessarily run afoul of any of the rules um at least not in the immediate term but mm. but what you see is you see countries sort of acknowledging that sometimes the the domestic needs of their populations will will be more important than mm. following these trade mm. rules and so if you see that Mm. in this context you start to open up your mind to see that in other contexts yeah, yeah. as well and so mm. there have been a lot of discussion about the parallels mm. between the climate crisis and the pandemic mm -hmm. yeah. um and and what kind of policies would be should be acceptable 
Mm -hmm. And so you see, um, to, to meet the, the needs of the climate crisis, to actually mm -hmm. collaborate globally, there will be a lot of domestic mm -hmm. uh, industrial policy needs, um, restructuring economies away from fossil fuels, I'm told, toward renewable right. energy mm -hmm. resources, of course. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's good that you mentioned that the corporation suing states and investor state, that's the investor state dispute angle, mm -hmm. which has, has gotten a, a lot of criticism in the last five to 10 years. Um, and before that too, but I think the criticism has become more mainstream. More countries yeah, are yeah. being willing to say, no, no, we don't, we no longer consent to being sued outside of our home states by private individuals, which yeah. was the state of play before investor state dispute settlement came, you know, came onto the scene right, yeah, somewhere yeah. in the late 1960s. Yeah. So mm -hmm. countries are saying, actually, we don't, we don't feel comfortable with this anymore. Mm -hmm. The risks are too high. And yeah. that's thanks thanks to a lot of research mm. that um, that that various various political scientists and economists and lawyers have done about the actual impacts of some yeah. of these. Yeah, actually, didn't some got more recent uh, trade agreements that that uh, explicitly ex exclude the uh, the investor state uh, dispute settlement mechanism? Yeah, in fact, the United the USMCA, the most recent NAFTA, has severe. Yeah. It hasn't disappeared uh -huh. ISDS, but it has uh -huh. it has constrained it so that it's right, right, right. applicable in certain cases. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm I'm probably gonna misstate this, but um, I, uh, I believe only legacy claims, which is to say uh -huh. claims having to do with events that happened during the coverage yeah. of the original NAFTA agreement uh -huh. are permitted under um, oh, I see. Yeah. In, in certain sectors under the um, yeah no i vaguely remember that uh, hearing that uh, australia refused to have it included yes. in this uh, free trade agreement with the us yeah. Uh, so yeah it's yeah. very interesting and, and actually i'm very thankful for um for uh institutions like UNCTA, the united yeah. nations conference on trade and development for having gathered a bunch of data on these treaties so you can mm -hmm. actually go online and you can right. find out what percentage of investment agreements that are you know that are uh -huh. that exist in the world have this investor yeah. state dispute settlement and i think mm -hmm. what you've started to see is there's there's there is most of them still that are in place still have them but mm. they're starting to um certain countries are just withdrawing wholesale um mm -hmm. from their investor state or from yeah. their investment treaties um, others are, are, as you mentioned, Australia is removing investor state disputes from their investment treaties without, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they'll leave it to either a state to state dispute mechanism or some sort yeah. of consultation process. Mm. Um, but, but I think, you know, rooting international, these sorts of conflicts between investors and states in judicial process, domestic judicial processes, um, is, is really, um, is, is the way to go for, for yeah. reform. Uh -huh. um especially because um because we have to have we have to have faith in those domestic processes um for for those investors and states to get yeah. the right to have their rights and responsibilities that's right yeah no no that, that for me that, that it smacks up uh, what used to be called uh, extra territoriality in the so-called unequal treaties of the 19th and early 20th century yeah, yeah. So stronger countries uh, open up uh, the, the weaker country with uh, gunboat uh, diplomacy, sometimes a uh, real war like uh, the OP war, mm -hmm. and then that the, you force them to sign an unequal treaty. One of the most uh, important elements that, uh, of it was uh, deprivation of tariff autonomy, that is uh, to set your own tariffs. But another key component that, that, that telling from my historical research is that uh, they they basically that the, the declare that the the, lo, uh, the national court of the weaker country is not uh, uh, up to scratch, and the citizens of the stronger nation who commit crime in the weaker nation always have to be sent back home to be tried there because uh, they don't trust uh, the local court. Yeah, yeah. so it that uh, really that that. Uh, the, the smacks of uh, that uh, practice, you know, that we cannot uh, trust uh, the national court, yeah, mm -hmm. because that uh, presumably that the national court of uh, I don't know, that uh, Ecuador is at uh, under the thumbs of uh, Ecuadorian government, 
and therefore that that, that we cannot trust it to make a that, 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 sorry the that, that settler dispute between us and the Ecuadorian government, we have to take it somewhere else. Yeah. I think there's something else there that that mm. um, that shows up as you see um, a lot of these, especially bilateral treaties. Um, the the original, the earliest bilateral investment treaties, especially, were mostly signed by more developed, more industrialized nations with the the lower income nations. That's right. Um, mm. and, and especially in order to um and with the promise of hey we'll we'll send you a lot of investment we'll send you mm -hmm. our companies and our companies will provide um jobs and they'll provide technology transfer mm -hmm. and look at mm -hmm. what foreign direct investment does and then if you sign this treaty this, you find out that if you read the fine print the treaty doesn't allow you to require them to do any of those things you can't require them to transfer technology or hire locally or use any local inputs in their in their um uh, in their production. And so mm. you end up uh, having sort of a false, um, sort of a, a false promise, right? You've promised yes, yeah. this, this is what it will mm. do, but it won't actually do that. And so mm. in these bilateral negotiations, you see also a difficulty of, um, a, 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 an imbalance of power. And so, uh, um, especially those earlier ones. And so I, what I think or, you know what my recommendation is that fewer of these fewer of these negotiations should be happening at that bilateral level mm -hmm. but at a multilateral level you yeah. are going to have um, a more adequate balance of power among the parties and among mm -hmm. the, the countries involved so yeah. i think that will help also um to avoid going forward to avoid um issues like you're saying where it's it's a, it's a patronizing arrangement mm -hmm. that you know, we don't trust your your courts, so we're going to create this separate court system. Mm -hmm. We we don't trust your you know current police protection power, so we're going to make sure you protect us, you know, extra special over and above you protect your own citizens. Yeah. Um, anyway, it through these treaties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, the, I guess uh, that's uh, why you know the the powerful countries uh, prefer bilateral or the regional the agreements yeah and uh, i mean yeah the the U european union when it had to rewrite the lawmaker convention it uh, basically created this uh, economic partnership agreement which uh, that that uh, that negotiated not that uh, with the 90 or so countries of uh, the so-called acp group uh, africa Caribbean Pacific uh, group, uh, the, the EU divided them into seven smaller groups and, you know, mm. with uh, the seven to 10 countries in each group, but uh, it was a lot easier for the EU to the push uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, line. And yeah, I'm, I'm told that in the, one of those groups, I think it was at, uh, the Central African group, but uh, the EU even wrote the draft text uh, for the other party because they lack the capacity uh, to do that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what kind of negotiation is that? I mean, you first uh, break them into the small weak groups, and then uh, to some of them, you even uh, bring your the, the, their, their text and say, well, the, the, this is our text, uh, that's the, your text, let's uh, talk about it. Yeah. So I think uh, that I mean one thing uh, that uh, has really struck me that uh, doing research on the, the issue of uh, policy space and uh, talking to uh, government negotiators and campaigners is uh, like the discrepancy in resources. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So for example, that I have a, a former student who used to be. Uh, Kind of uh, in charge of the economics uh, the affair in the Geneva uh, mission uh, of a developing country. I mean, I wouldn't name the country. I mean, it's a fairly big country. But he said that even for us, uh, you know, the, there are like three people basically the, who can the, attend these negotiations because uh, we might have uh, a lot more people, but. Half of them are just uh, political appointees uh, who play golf every day, and you know, uh, the other half uh, don't have a clue about the economic issues. So he said, every day, Geneva being Geneva, 
we have like uh, 12 meetings to attend between the three of us. What do we do? We you know, drop uh, half of them. We try to go to a couple of them each. And then sometimes that uh, we you know, uh, make a contribution. Sometimes we are completely lost uh, because we walked in there at uh, the 2 p.m. Yeah? But then he said that uh, even that, uh, he said that <laughs> still the, our, uh, the, my country is uh, lucky because uh, there are, well, this was the, the, the early 2000s, so the, the, the numbers must have changed. But he said there are 22 developing countries which have no one, no one in Geneva. So, and uh, he said that in contrast, the United States have about uh, something like 50 people working on intellectual property rights alone. Yeah? And you call this negotiation. Yeah? Yeah. So I think uh, that, yeah, that, uh, you know, we, we probably need to uh, set up a system of kind of, you know, subsidize uh, the, 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 the legal advice uh, to developing countries or something like that to, to redress uh, the imbalance. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't thought very carefully about the, the nuts and bolts of, of the negotiation process in Geneva uh, for a long time. But um, one thing that, that um, I was part of an edited vo volume some years ago, and, and there was a, a, there was a chapter in there, and I'm, I'm going to uh, fail to remember all of the details, but there was a chapter in there about um, about developing country uh, coalitions and coalition building and how that mm, can be used. Mm. Um, that has its ups and down, uh, you know, upsides and downsides, but um, that's one way for countries to um, work together um, for countries that don't have as much representation to um, to provide, you know, to to receive more help. Mm. Um, but I think that's you know that's not going to resolve the the real fundamental inequality no, no, course, that yeah. you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think there there will have to be a cap and the, the capacity building to meet the meet the the demands of the rules mm -hmm. um, should also be there should also be a, a building of capacity for you know uh, for engaging adequately at the negotiating table. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and so, yeah, that that will have to be um, that will have to be something that I think. Um, will be essential to making the um, making the institution or, or sustaining the institution over the long term. So if we're talking mm. about the WTO as an institution, I mean there are a lot of issues going on right now. A lot of a lot of countries are, and I mentioned some of them when we were introducing this conversation. Yeah. Um, but um, most in most cases, what you see is a tension between the requirements or the demands or the needs of the developing countries mm. and the requirements, demands, needs of the developed countries. And so yeah. um, what you've started to see is that um, the developed countries largely or the wealthier countries have started to bind together in these plurilateral negotiations and yeah. say, oh, we're just mm. negotiating over mm. here on the side. We're going to mm. come up with something. If you want to sign, you can. If you don't, yeah. you know, we really think it's the great way, the best way to organize, mm. uh, you know, or to, to um, make new rules about investment, mm. to make new rules about digital trade, to make new mm. rules about services regulation. Um, and what that does is that de facto excludes those countries even more. Right. Exactly. So what we have is while we have an already mm -hmm. system, now we're creating even greater imbalances by yeah. by having these separate side negotiations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and so um uh it I, I think this is a real you know structural institutional problem that yeah. that um the WTO members will have to uh, address in the near term mm -hmm. um or else lose a lot of lose a lot of face with most of its yeah. development country members. Yeah, and also that uh, if I mean the, when when the, those uh, voluntary plurilateral the agreement comes into being, that kind of sets the standard, doesn't it? Yeah. So mm -hmm. that uh, yeah, you are not obliged to sign up to that, but uh, people would uh, expect uh, you to kind of uh, follow that closely, if not completely. And then it becomes a, a de facto rule that, that we just decided without your participation. Yeah? Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm. Um, so we have a, a few, we have about 20 minutes left, and we have some questions from sure. our audience. Is it okay? 
with you if we start asking some yeah, questions? Yeah, let's do that, yeah. All right, so um, I'll just read about one at a time unless I can see that they're sort of combined, but just for, for the sakes of, for the sake of um, being able to manage it, we'll, we'll tackle one at a time. Um, so here's a question about the country of Chile from Thomas O'Keefe. Um, acknowledging the country's shortcomings and addressing the issue of income concentration, which is tied to policies unrelated to trade, how do you explain the success of Chile that has used free trade agreements since the 1990s to bring huge numbers of Chileans out of poverty and into the middle class? Do you want to start by tackling that one, Hadrian? Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> the, no, actually, the, the, the so-called Chilean the success uh, the, of the 1990s, I mean, it's uh, the, actually not exactly what it seems, yeah? Because that uh, first of all, Chile the, before the the, the mid nineteen nineties uh, used the uh, capital control yeah, mm -hmm. to regulate that uh, speculative uh, capital. I mean, this uh, so called deposit system where uh, the, the money comes in, you have to keep uh, something like 30, 40 percent of uh, the sum uh, in a deposit. And if you leave uh, that within less than a year, you lose that. Yeah? During that period that, that Chile also used uh, a lot of uh, industrial policy, only that, that, that those policies are not applied to manufacturing, but to agriculture sector. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the start of the salmon industry was that, uh, basically the government with the, 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 the subsidized uh, the technical consultancy from Japan the importing you know, salmon farming technology and, uh, you know, the providing the technical support mm -hmm. uh, the, to salmon the farmers, you know, the, the, the government uh, owning the, much of the forest and the, the kind of growing trees for paper mills. And, you know, so it uh, was actually a lot more interventionist than the, what people think, you know, the, I don't know how, I mean, the, the those policies uh, touched upon, uh, sorry, uh, violated or not uh, the WTO rules, uh, I do not know, but, uh, you know, WTO uh, came into being only in 1995, so uh, probably during half that period that uh, it uh, that was not relevant. But also, uh, you know, the, what has been happening in Chile in the last few years uh, that tells you that, yeah, that uh, stra strategy might have uh, been quite uh, effective, but, uh, in, in bringing uh, Chile up to a certain level, mm -hmm. but you know the, it has uh, run out of steam. You know the, the countries that the growth uh, has been anemic uh, the, in the last uh, the 10, 15 years. You know the income inequality is uh, the, remains still high. You know so the, that's why you had all those riots, uh, constitutional the, uh, assembly, and the prospect of but. Uh, you know, the former left-wing student leader in his 30s, uh, possibly becoming uh, the president. So, yeah, I mean, the, I wouldn't, you know, kind of dismiss uh, what Chile achieved in the 1990s, but A, it wasn't exactly what uh, people think it was, you know, mm. and B, you know, that, that even that uh, has uh, run out of steam and, you know, that tells you uh, that of the importance of, uh, the ability to use uh, the uh, mm -hmm. policies that uh, fit uh, the, your stages of development, which is that uh, now quite a lot more difficult because of uh, the WTO and other free trade agreements that uh, Chile has uh, so keenly signed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's a really helpful way to think about it. I I likewise don't know. Um, very many of the specifics of how their specific policies would have um, uh, would have been in conflict with free trade agreements, but I can say that Chile was actually very careful. You mentioned at first, Tajun, the um, their capital uh, controls that they put in place, and they were actually very careful to include uh, an exception in an annex to allow them to continue to impose capital controls as needed, um, even you know, even um, when they weren't actually in place, because I think they had a, a mm. you know, they well, I think a, they had to scrap it eventually because they signed a free trade agreement with the US. Mm 
Well, I think even in the US yeah. they have oh, they have this. Okay, yeah. 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 So so that was the that was the interesting mm -hmm. that was the interesting thing that I remember from yeah. looking at the US Chile right. free trade agreement. And and it's possible that they had other um that they sort of carved out other space since it seems like they were aware the Chilean government was aware of of mm -hmm. some of the constraints that they would otherwise yeah. have. Although I, I can't speak to that specifically. Mm. Um, we we did have some colleagues who did a, some research on the impact of the US Chile free trade agreement on um, access to uh, accesses to medicines and, and whether it changed the prices of certain medicines. And they found in, in their study that it did increase the prices of the medicines, but also the also the, the amount of medicines imported. So there's, there's still, I think there's still research to be done about Chile and about, well, about each country and, and to know how, whether, you know, what role the free trade agreement plays in bringing people out of poverty, in facilitating access to certain products or, or what, whatnot. Each of those questions are, are really complex and have to be answered ind independently, I think. Um, shall we go on to the next? All right. Um, uh, Stephen Malkowitz from NYU asks, um, what are the top three principles to keep in mind when designing a proactive industrial policy for a new city project? Um, such projects are larger than uh, special economic zones, but still subsidiary to WTO and national and regional government governance. Uh, he clarifies that the question is particularly for new city projects in middle income countries where competition on pure labor may not be feasible. Um, that's a really interesting question about industrial policy. Would you like to take a stab at it? Uh, you're muted. Hadi. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, principles. Uh, yeah, the, first of all, I think uh, various uh, economic theories and the successes and failures of uh, industrial policies have but uh, taught us that there are a few key principles that we need to keep in mind in uh, designing these uh, policies, uh, industrial policies of any type. I mean, whether it's a special economic zone or the, you know, promoting certain national champions and so on. So first of all, we need to treat, uh, especially in the developing country context, uh, the industrial policy as a kind of uh, national investment, yeah. In that, of course, that uh, by refusing to engage in the free trade and free market, you are that uh, likely to, although not always, that uh, will that uh, likely to forego current income, yeah. If you are importing, yeah, you know, the, the uh, Japanese cars, and suddenly you want to develop your own car industry and the, uh, the putting tariff on Japanese cars, your consumers are going to suffer, yeah. But you have to see it as an investment in the future. You know, South Korea the, in the, the, its attempt to develop uh, the automobile industry, the, you know, until the, the late 1980s, uh, banned the import of all foreign cars. Yeah? Import of uh, Japanese cars were banned until the 1990s. But uh, the, exactly because of that, the, the, it was able to, you know, grow this car company Hyundai, which uh, used to produce 0.2% of uh, what General Motors was uh, producing back in the, the mid 1970s into a company that actually produces uh, more cars than uh, General Motors today, yeah, since uh, the nine, uh, 2015. Yeah? So the, 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 you have to see this as a the investment in the future. So, you know, whether you are losing money, the current uh, currently the, with your policy is uh, secondary. The question is whether you can the, the make it the, the, the bring in the, the greater gains in the future. But uh, secondly, we learned that uh, in order to ensure that, uh, that this uh, return is uh, the, the, the realized, you need to discipline the recipients of uh, the, the state uh, support. Yeah? Because many countries have failed in the industrial policy by yes, uh, protecting uh, the infant industries, giving them subsidies, but not uh, asking them to deliver. Eh? Mm. So you have uh, the ridiculous cases that, uh, like uh, in India, where uh, you know the, the bunch of industries were promoted initially as infant industries, mm. and then the, the, the 
a few decades later were put on the list of sick industries. Yeah? So they uh, didn't even grow up. Yeah? Yeah. They uh, <laughs> moved from nursery uh, to the hospital yeah? rather than nursery uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the bigger society. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, another principle. But then thirdly, it, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the lesson out, uh, uh, sorry, principle that I would uh, uh, emphasize is that uh, principles are valid only at the general level. Yeah? Exactly how you develop this and that in this or that country, in this or that city, I mean, that will really depend on you know, the, the local conditions, not just in terms of uh, economic resources, but uh, the, you know, the, the political the consensus uh, around the project, you know? kind of uh, the, the, the design of uh, policies, you know. So, you know, I mean, the, 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 there are some broad uh, principles like uh, infant industry protection, Albert Hirschman's idea of uh, linkages, you know, and so on, but that, uh, you know, exactly how you develop this and that, that, that project in, I don't know, Medellin in Colombia, you know, that, that's that, uh, another level of exercise, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you said it as, you know, much more than I, I could have in terms of condensing it to principles. Um, I, when I think about um, proactive industrial policy, the first thing that comes to mind to, for me is Bangladesh because of their, um, the, their building up of their, their domestic pharmaceutical industry um, mm. on the mind because of a project that, that we recently um, have been, that we've been working on here at the GDP Center. Um, mm. But one that thing that's important, and then they did all of the things that you're suggesting. And as a result, while they were importing something like 95% of their medicines in 1980, by 2010, they were producing for 95% of the demand, for domestic demand um, mm. domestically, and therefore had mm. a really, have a, a much more developed um, uh, domestic pharmaceutical industry that is even exporting to some developed countries, yeah. which is really remarkable for a least developed country. That's right. um, um, and, and one thing that they have, one thing that they have uh, run into is that uh, they're on the verge of graduating, thanks in part to this success, they're on the verge of graduating from LDC status, mm. which means in part that all those rules that would have kept them from doing all those things are going to come into place. <laughs> That's right. So in, in their, their next, Bangladesh's next goal is to develop more of a, of a raw materials industry. So mm -hmm. they're not just importing all the raw materials and putting them yeah. together mm -hmm. in medicines, but they're actually producing mm -hmm. some of those raw mm -hmm. materials as well. Um, and that's sort of the next step for maturing their industry. Well, if they graduate before they are able to do that, what we'll see is, is, is a, a reversal of that progress. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I think about when we talk about um, principles to keep in mind is that, yep. that um, um, a lot of the success stories have, have somehow skirted these rules mm -hmm. <laughs> in some way. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, that's something that I think yep. of um, in that context. Um, all right, we have another question. This one is from uh, Jerry Harris from the Global Studies Association. Uh, Jerry says, you seem to assume that the IMF and advanced <laughs> countries want some type of equality and fair development. Aren't they invested in the exact opposite, dominance and using the global south for their profits? Where is the room for real reform? This is a, this is a, a hard question. Um, um, well, you go first, uh, Rachel. <laughs> you want me to go first? <laughs> um, well, I think there's, I think there are a few ways to tackle this. We could. Um, we could look at the world and see how it's set up and say um, it's clear that the developed world um, wants to keep their dominance. Um, and um, I think that's pretty natural for people in power to want to keep the power that they have. Um, I think that there is a way, I think there are ways forward to use some of the priorities of the developed world to um, to the benefit of all if we can if we can if we can cast it that way so uh, one thing that i've thought a lot about is the importance of competition so uh, you know under traditional theories and padre and i will probably misidentify this in some way so feel free to correct me but under my understanding is that under traditional theories of, sort of 
of economic development uh, or of economics, um, you know, we, we assume, we often assume a perfect, a system of perfect competition where, you know, people can enter the market and everyone is, everyone who's producing a given good is, is competing on a level playing field. Well, that's globally speaking, that's clearly not true. Not just anyone can enter a market at any given time and compete. Um, and, um, and, and to the extent that, that, that many of these models require more, more competition, um, we could argue that these rules, if we give space for countries to develop, we're going to increase consumer benefit worldwide and con consumer welfare worldwide, where we have more competitors producing whatever it is, high-tech yeah. goods, pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. services, you know, global services. So there is, there is, that's sort of my, you know, way to sort of cast it so that we can say, yeah, sure, competition mm. could be good for consumer welfare. Here is a way to actually increase it. Mm. Um, but we do have to have a bit of optimism um, about, about people's genuine um, motivations. Or, of course, we can't assume that there would be any reform. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, no. I think that uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, the, in in kind of uh, arguing that uh, developing countries are trying to develop new industries is uh, engaged in anti-competitive behavior. Actually, the you know the rich countries are uh, contradicting themselves because, as you said, I mean, if you have better you know car producers from Japan, you know, the more efficient. Uh, pharmaceutical producers from India and Bangladesh, actually the globally consumers are going to benefit. Yeah? So once again, I mean, the, if you shift the perspective, I mean, the whole thing that, that, that has been presented as some kind of, you know, the evil uh, attempt by, by developing countries to undermine competition is actually a, a way of uh, the, the increasing competition. Yeah? But I think that, uh, I mean, the, the in, in response to, uh, the, the, to the question, I would say, yes, I mean, of course, that uh, the, the rich countries uh, want to keep the existing uh, international order, the IMF uh, and the World Bank are, are basically controlled by the rich countries, especially the US, but, you know, just that, that think of how the world has actually changed, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that, uh, th these countries are a lot weaker than before, you know, the IMF, of course, uh, a lot of it is at uh, lip service, but uh, is now worried about income inequality. You know, it's at uh, more open to using capital control. You know, so very slowly that the, the, the world is that the, the, the changing, and the rise of China. You know, as a good Korean, I'm not a big fan of but uh, China becoming stronger. But you know, once again, competition is good. Yeah, I mean that the in. The 80s and 90s, when I started up my academic career, you know, there was only one bank in town called the World Bank. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> if you didn't like that bank, if that, uh, well, more importantly, if that bank uh, didn't like you, you didn't get any money. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now you have uh, that the uh, alternative financial sources, you know, Bank of the, the, the South, you know, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, the yeah. development banks are from China. So, you know, the, I think. Yeah, the, uh, while I uh, basically agree with the questioner in you know, the intention of uh, the, the rich countries and the international organizations are controlled by them, I think uh, that I would uh, be a bit uh, more optimistic than uh, he is in saying that, that uh, despite that, that uh, we, we have uh, been pushing things and, and yeah, some changes have been achieved. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful way to think about it. And, and as I noted earlier, you know, changes don't happen all at once. They're often very incremental and mm -hmm. slow. Um, um, yeah. But we can see, we can we have seen over the past 30 years changes in the international mm. legal structure. Mm. And, and it's encouraging to sort of hope for what we could produce in the next, in the next 30 years. Um, well, uh, we didn't get to nearly as many questions and answers as uh, people posted, and I'm so sorry that we didn't, but it's been a real pleasure uh, to sit with you, Hajun, and, and, and talk. Um, if any of you have questions that you want to follow up with me, um, you're definitely welcome to do that. Um, and, and we are so grateful that you joined us. We're thankful.
Uh, thankful to Hajun for sharing your thoughts. Um, and the talk, as I mentioned before, has been recorded and it's on YouTube. Um, we will share the link in the chat for you. And if you would like to receive any updates uh, about our publications or any future GDP Center events, you can subscribe from the Global Economic Governance Initiative, uh, which uh, that link is also, I believe, in the chat. Thanks to all of you, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, and finally, thank you, Rachel, for writing this wonderful book. <laughs>